Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first uh, installment of these uh, online video lectures as a way that we're handling uh, class time. Um, I have a bunch of things I want to say at the beginning here, uh, kind of following up on the email I sent out yesterday. Um, definitely, it's a big email. Please read it all, though. Lots of important information there about just getting straight on what's going on. But like I say in the email, if you have any questions about what's happening and how it's happening, um, by all means, let me know. I don't want there to be um, any surprises here. I want the, this to go as smoothly as we can possibly make it. Um, but let me clarify some things that I said in the email. Or, or they're, I'm basically repeating myself, but that's fine, uh, just to make sure that this is all, all making sense. Um, the uh, Let's talk about attendance and uh, reading comments. Reading comments pretty straightforward. You're going to upload them to Canvas just like you did for journal assignments, but now the reading comments are are handled in that kind of way. So, you know, I have a Canvas assignment like I always do for reading comments. Uh, the only thing that's changed is that now there's an upload feature. So from here on out, reading comments can just be uploaded directly to Canvas. Uh, if something's going weird or uh, it gets closed down or something like that, um, just email them to me. Like uh, I've been, that's how I've been taking things late all quarter long. So you can use that too. You can just email it to my philosophy at gmail.com. That works fine too. But um, I'm I'm making that upload feature the the main way to do it. Uh, definitely prefer use it that way rather than blow up my inbox. Um, but the email works in a pinch too. Um, for attendance, this is how I want to do it. Um, whether you are live right now watching the lecture in the chat or you um, are watching this on YouTube later it's going to be the same across the board so I think I initially maybe in class I was mentioning I might take attendance while doing the lecture I'm not going to do that I thought about it some more and I'm like I'm going to take up class time to to manage that and it'll just be messy people coming in late I don't want to be stopping the lecture all the time so um, we have a much more straightforward way we can do this and the way that it'll be handled for people after um, who are watching this on YouTube after it's been recorded will be the same thing that all of you right now who are here live uh, will handle it as well. Um, oh, my audio cut out? Is it back? Uh-oh. Can you hear me now? How's that? that good good okay where'd you lose me I don't know why that happened uh, haven't had any problems all morning with my other classes um, oh it looks like someone mute, muted me <laughs> I don't know I didn't know other people had the power to do that someone muted me um, where, where where did uh, everyone lose me You heard about the reading comments? Yep. Okay. Attendance? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Maybe just that last bit. Okay, so the way attendance is working, just summarize it again. Sorry for the mix-up here. Uh, the way attendance is working is whether you're watching this on YouTube later, like after it's been recorded, whoa, squirrel. Um, or you're live right now in the lecture right now, the procedure protocol is going to be exactly the same. I will be making a assignment on Canvas, just like I normally have assignments for attendance. I just manually input it all. Um, now there's going to be a quiz. And when you open up the quiz, uh, there will be a link to the recorded YouTube video where I'm posting this after it's done. we're done doing the lecture. Um, and then there will be a short quiz question. And it's not going to be something substantive. It won't be like, explain Nagel's argument against anti-realism or something like that. It'll be a code. I'll just ask you for a code word. At, at some point in this video, um, oh, can someone mute their microphone? We're getting echo on my contribution. Thank you. Um, more on that in a second, actually. I'll talk about that. Um, so, oh, it's still going. I can hear it. Um, Hello. Can you can you mute your microphone? Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Um, so uh, when you open up the quiz, it'll just ask you for a code word. And at some point during this video lecture, I will give you a code 
uh, I'll say a code word and then you'll uh, you'll just plug it into the quiz on Canvas for that is marked for like video lecture for March 3rd for 3-3. It'll be something like that. Um, and that's how you'll handle it. If you get any run into any difficulties with that, let me know. It'll be a, an essay question format, so you'll just have a text field, and you'll just type in what the code is and submit it, and and then I'll go through them and grade them, and that'll how that'll be how we handle attendance. Um, so that's that's going to be the procedure there. Uh, since we just had the little microphone thing, let's talk about that. Or any questions about reading comments or attendance? That's all clear. Anyone in chat have questions about it? Okay. Didn't hear the reading comments part. Reading comments are going to be uploaded to Canvas just like the way you do journals from now on. How do you get to the quiz? It'll be posted on Canvas. So as soon as this lecture is done, I will be creating an assignment um, for the attendance for today. And you'll open it up and there'll be a quiz question right there. It'll, it'll take a, a short amount of time for me to get the recording encoded and then upload it to YouTube and then I'll publish the assignment um, and you'll be able to submit the, the code for the quiz. It might, it might take a little getting used to for this new rhythm for how the class is working. I've used this format with my online classes many, many times before. Uh, it, gets, it gets smooth. Um, so if it's a little rocky at first, that'll, it'll get, get to be pretty normal. The, like I said, the quizzes are not um, substantive. They're just, just remember the code word when I say it and like write it down or something if you need to um, and then submit it to, to that Canvas assignment. Okay, um, in terms of uh, talking and sharing the, the virtual classroom space here, um, the way I've usually done this before with online students has been um, have your microphone muted at the beginning uh, when, you, when you come into the, um, to the chat room and then you're absolutely free to use your microphone if you want to. Um, no problems with that. Uh, it could just be a thing like you put a, a little uh, text into the I am conversation saying like, hey, I got a question or I got a comment or I want to say something. And then I'll just know when I get to like a little stopping point with whatever sentence I'm speaking, um, I'll make some space and let you, and then you can jump in on the microphone and be like, yeah, what's up? And then you can unmute your microphone, say whatever you want to say. Uh, if you want to communicate just using the IM, that's cool too. Helena, is that a is that symbol there like a, a hand raise? Is that uh, the little bracket with a um, quotation mark? Oh, it was accidental. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, just a little short comment. Say, hey, I got something I want to ask. Is cool. Also, sometimes. Um, I can see when people are like typing something in the I am conversation, like someone's in the middle of putting together a message. If you've got like a longer question or a longer message and you don't want us to like keep going before we lose it, if you just say like, hey, I got a question and then and then start typing the longer one, then I'll know to like hang on and, and wait up before uh, going on to something else and then your question or comment is maybe no longer relevant or not the right time for it. Um, I definitely want space for student involvement here. so. Um, let me know that you've got something you want to contribute and we'll, we'll make the space for it. That's, that's always the biggest thing that I'm nervous about with online formats for instruction when I've taught online classes in the past is it's not as dynamic and being able to, it's, it's a little harder, we have to work harder at making a conversational thing happen. Um, but I'm a big fan of student participation. I mean, it, ma it just makes the class better for everybody. So um, very much want to encourage you to participate in whatever way you want to do that. If you want to use microphone, you want to use text, uh, either way. So please do that. Um, but just in the meantime, when you're when you're not saying something, have the microphone muted so that there isn't more noise in the in the chat. Okay. And then I had two other things I very much wanted to say here before I get we get back into Williams and Nagel and realism and anti-realism and the end of explanation article. And that was, uh, f first off, I, I want to just say a thank you. Um, I want to express my uh, gratitude for everyone. I, I said this in the email too, but over the last like 12, 24 hours, I've received a lot of communication from students about them expressing 
very earnest, deep gratitude that we decided to take this path and that we're handling the class this way. And people have been thanking me. I don't really think I deserve a whole lot of thanks for this. All I'm doing is facilitating it or um, kind of making the judgment call to do it. But I'm just being responsive to the circumstances and kind of my point of view, like doing my job. <laughs> and I know how to do it this way, and I'm happy to do it this way. It's a little extra work, but it's not a big deal. It's my job to do it. The real thanks goes to you because switching up a class format like this with a couple weeks left um, when you're trying to finish up everything, I mean, there's there's going to be – there's cost to our choice to do things this way. And um, – and you all are the ones who shoulder that burden. You you pay that cost much more than me. Um, so I wanted to. I'm not going to say anything about people's personal circumstances or or what's going on. None of the details of it. But I w I do want to say I want to kind of pass along. There are not just a few. There are a lot of students in all of my classes um, who have been where this is something much bigger than just peace of mind or something where there's there are real heavy consequences um, that are attached to the position that they're in before we made this choice and that this choice has like changed the game really significantly for them so um, I, I think you deserve the those expressions of gratitude I, I if you could hear the things that some people have said to me um, I, I would want you to have that. And I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to take private communications <laughs> and pass them along. But I can report that uh, I feel no problems reporting how uh, deeply uh, people are appreciative of what we're doing here. Um, and I, I, I think it is the right call too. So um, inconveniences and burdens that come from this is, uh, is something that you deserve credit for, um, for making this happen. <laughs> And that's kind of the second thing I wanted to talk about. I do know that for, for some students, doing things the way that we're doing them, doing this online-only format, is not just an inconvenience, that it is uh, more serious than that. Um, and this is across the board on all my classes, too. Uh, some, some, A couple of my classes have more people that are in this kind of boat than others. Um, but for, for some students, this situation is much less ideal than if we had kept doing things in the standard format. Um, so I see that. I hear, uh, I've heard that um, from people that um, there are some deeper, thing, things that are deeper than just inconvenience. Um, and those are significant costs. And all the more thanks to you for your flexibility in, in going along with this. Um, but the other, it, it's not just a matter of gratitude because that can seem really empty given the circumstances for for some of some of my students that are in this boat um, this is all the more reason why it is really important to me that people let me know what kind of complications are emerging for them based on switching to this style of instruction this modality this format for instruction um, I you know I've been uh, advertising all quarter how much I want all of you to reach out to me get support from me for everything we can do to help set you up for success in this class and make the most out of the opportunity um, of this quarter. But this goes like double, triple, quadruple for for this uh, abnormal set of circumstances and, and way that we're handling things. Oh, I'm worried this wind is going to blow my computer over. <laughs> um, so I just, I just want to kind of, whoa, re-up on that and... Um, make that advertisement and invitation very explicit once more and I'll probably keep keep doing something like that but um, anyone uh, in the chat uh, have questions comments about all this setup stuff for today oh thanks is the wind coming over the microphone too? I'm kind of curious about that. It's really windy all of a sudden. Okay. Don't hear the wind. Awesome. <laughs> Just the bells. Oh yeah, the bells. Are they distracting? I could probably take that down. It's kind of nice. <laughs> 
Maybe? I don't know. If it's annoying, you let me know. Will there be a link to every meeting? Because um, I was having trouble getting on Skype. Uh, I was able to just when I joined as a guest. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, I kind of wanted to... I forgot to mention something about this, too. Um, so, especially if you're having technical difficulties with Skype, please let me know. If you're watching this on YouTube later because you weren't able to get connected, let me know. Let's get them cleaned up as soon as possible. Um, the links that I'm going to be sending out will happen every day. There will be a different link for every day because every time I open up a new chat window, Skype like tags it in a different way. So you, that, that announcement that you saw this morning and they, um, the email I sent out, that will show up every every day uh, that'll always happen um, and once you've got Skype for business installed then you, you can just click on that link and it should take you right here um, if you had any complications I definitely want to know about that uh, so we can get it sorted out sooner rather than later looks like there's another message coming in I'm just going to take a pause for a second. Okay, good to know. I did have the Skype business, but uh, it did send me to the link, but I think it was a problem on my end just with my own password, so I think I can get it figured out. Okay, cool. Also, by the way, I'm going to be like repeating back uh, over the microphone what people say in the chat. Um, one, because it's not recorded by uh, for people on YouTube later. But two, even if you use your microphone, the the my microphone doesn't pick up my own speakers, and I'm using headphones anyway here. Um, so uh, I will usually repeat back what you say just so that people watching this later can follow and understand what's going on. So in case you're wondering why I'm doing that as a reflex, that's that's what's going on there. Okay, shall we get uh, into Williams? Anything else before we, we go back to the discussion that we were having uh, Friday last week? Good, all right. Got a, people, a couple people typing messages here. All good, okay. Is there a way to replicate the drawings you would normally put on the whiteboard? Yes, I have Microsoft Paint up, and uh, <laughs> and I may bring it. Uh, here's a, something I had for my last class. Um, uh, I may. Uh, let's see. A way for me to clean it without wiping it. I may use that. Uh, I think in yeah, MS Paint for the win. Um, I may. Uh, not use the whiteboard quite as much, um, but where it's relevant, uh, absolutely we can do that. And if there's something that you would like to have depicted up on the whiteboard, we can absolutely do that. Um, yeah, we've got three Nathans. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, we can use whiteboard here. Yeah, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have the reading out too to be able to follow along there. That works pretty good. Um, <laughs> your clones <laughs> yep um, all right so let's let's get back into it so on Friday we ended class talking with this idea uh, talking about this idea from Nagel about how we can't just reduce people's um, argumentative positions or perspectives uh, we can't merely explain them in terms of some kind of causal explanation or as a result of bias, like psychological, sociological, political bias of some type. Um, and the key, key word there was merely. You can't treat our disagreement merely as a product of that. And the contrast of that is to understand it or explain it or analyze it in terms of rational considerations. And we were talking through this scenario of like, which a bunch of people raise their hands of like, yeah, this has happened to me before, where you're presenting an argument and someone just dismisses it by an accusation of bias. 
oh, you just believe that because of blah, 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 blah. That was the kind of scenario we described. And um, I was saying, one, it's not fun when someone does that. But I did clarify that um, whatever sort of discomfort or annoyance is connected with it, it can't be because of, an, of just any old accusation of bias. Because bias is something we, we worry about if we are, say, rational optimists. You remember the rational optimism, rational pessimism distinction? Um, it matters if we're true seekers to have the humility to recognize that we may not be fully rational. We don't. We may not meet one of those ideal conditions for rational optimism, or that that scenario that we're discussing with rational optimism. We might not be fully rational people, and if our thinking is being distorted by bias or influenced by bias, that's something we'd absolutely want to know about. The problem is if that's all we're being uh, thought of as, or if that's the only way in which we are being understood or received. Um, the the merely part operating there because someone someone could be like oh hmm, that's an interesting argument let me entertain it fairly oh wait I've got a concern about this line of thinking it seems to have undue influence from this direction or that direction you know what do we think about that that would be maybe okay you know to be like concerned about bias we can help check each other on our biases that's actually one of the biggest advantages of cooperative truth seeking as opposed to just individualistic you can't see the things you don't see right and someone else may be able to see that for you and offer that as something rationally relevant in evaluating the reasoning that you're offering but when you're reduced to just a causal object like your belief forming mechanisms don't have any rational contribution that you're not capable of engaging with this in terms of reasons or to think about what does make the most sense what is the most rationally defensible position then we're kind of in a different category um, it, I think some of the those emotions or intuitions that we have when someone plays that like bias card against you and that feels bad or uh, like what, what's maybe happening there is how it can be dehumanizing um, like the same kind of paternalistic way in which um, maybe you've been treated by parents or authority figures or teachers or something like that I definitely have had those experiences before where someone's like oh can you know, trust to my judgment here because you don't know what you're talking about kind of thing um, you're not in a position to be able to participate with the open truth seeking discussion about this um, you don't have the capacity to engage with that at all now that's that's kind of a little different than saying to, than encouraging something like modesty this is what Nagel's worried about when he's thinking about his anti-realist opponents so let's kind of go back I'm, I'm just doing some recap here from Friday because it's it's been a long time since then um, I want to kind of set this up again and again please jump into the chat if you're like wait can you talk about that idea a little bit more or I'm not sure I understand this or any comments that you want to jump in I really want this to not just be me talking into a box for 50 minutes every day <laughs> so keep the keep the comments coming um, okay uh, so framing this back up Nagel is defending realism and realists believe that there is objective universal truth not necessarily that they know it but that it is there um, it is there to be known and we've been saying with the extra wrinkle onto this that you are a realist who is also a rational optimist so you think that there that reason would be capable theoretically of resolving any of the disagreements we have about what that objective universal truth is supposed to look like so as we try to pursue knowing that truth um, Nagel wants to say it's not just a matter of we'll make guesses and maybe it'll turn out to correspond with how things actually are or not but that we can actually gain knowledge of this objective universal truth or get closer to it or something like that right? we can make progress toward understanding that truth um, with rational argumentation basically that there are objective matters about which positions are more rationally defensible than which other positions that's what Nagel wants to defend in his book, The Last Word, which Bernard Williams is reviewing in the article that you that you read. Okay, so but we're still this first part of the lecture is all just about understanding Nagel before we get into Williams' commentary on him, um, which I said on Friday is going to be a like, yep, kind of agree with you, Nagel, but right there's uh, there's some we're going to take this with a grain of salt. So Bernard Williams wants to offer some critical commentary there too, while still mostly agreeing with Nagel. But Nagel wants to, def he, like uh, in that quote we read on Friday, 
Nagel wants to vindicate our rationality so that when we adopt positions like we think science is a great way to learn about the world and superior to other ways in which people form judgments about the world or that we so that's on the descriptive side of the spectrum of true seeking and on the normative side that um, we're we're in a better moral position with the modern worldview of liberalism that and by that we just mean that there are fundamental human rights that we should be respecting in all people regardless and that tolerance is a good thing like those those this, these are just toy examples to play with but Nagel wants Nagel wants to say not that's not just our culture we're right to do that and maybe in the future the conversation will keep going and we'll come up with better uh, ways of doing science and better ways of thinking about morality too um, but we're definitely making some progress on this and believing in human rights is more objectively correct than disregarding human rights or valuing tolerance is justified over being intolerant right these are this kind of objectivity coupled with a rational justification that demonstrates its objectivity is really what Nagel wants to defend here. So who he's taking as his opponents, these anti-realists, are people who um, attempt to, uh, they're going to play this game about bias as an attempt to diffuse the objective authority of rational argument, arguments that are offered on behalf of, say, science or liberalism. Okay, So that's the setup. Um, if we think about it and we're like, yeah, the arguments in favor of universal human rights just hold so much more water than anything anyone can say to defend um, why we should not respect human rights or adopt a worldview that ha has no space for them. They, those positions just can't hold water. You can't defend fascism. You can't defend feudalism um, or a monarchy or um, religious intolerance or all these sorts of things. They just, like, they're indefensible. When we look at the arguments... This makes so much more sense. And then the opponent comes back and says, so you think you're looking at this fairly and treating all the arguments and able to sort out what makes more sense than something else, but actually that's just another bias. That's just Western civilization, you know, Western culture with its emphasis on reason um, and its emphasis on science uh, and that re that is sort of prejudiced against these alternative worldviews or alternative lifestyles or alternative belief sets or Goodman world, something like that. I mean, Goodman wanted to say even that there's objective standards about how we put those perspectives together. But this opponent that Nagel's trying to deal with, this anti-realist, is saying, you're just biased from your time and place. It's because you were born into a tw late 20th, early 21st century world with Western values that you think these things are so compelling. And that's it. And it dismisses all of the argumentation that Nagel would want to offer to defend it. It's trying to like deflate some of the force of that argument by bringing up this risk of bias. Okay? Usually that happens. Like if you find out that you're biased on something, it diminishes your confidence, right? Helena says, why are those unjustifiable? Um, I'm not sure which, what are the those you're referring to, Helena. Like, why is a rejection of human rights unjustifiable? Is that what you're wondering? Oh, oh, fascism and feudalism and all this kind of stuff. Why are those unjustifiable? Okay, 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 okay. Um, I don't want to get into all of the can of worms there because there's actually been a ton of work done by philosophers to argue against these things. Um, so rehearsing all those arguments is not something that um, I'm interested in doing right now, but I would highly recommend that you take a ethical theory class or, or the... Um, Philosophy 102, I think, uh, Contemporary Moral Problems, 
uh, I teach that class basically like an introduction to ethical theory, and you would get those kinds of arguments. So why is universal justice the right way to live? Um, why universal compassion? Those kinds of things. Um, there's, there's a ton of problems uh, with things like fascism. <laughs> um, but Nagel, Nagel is not interested in just giving all those arguments. He's, he's worried about uh, a kind of dispute here, a philosophical dispute, that's not even interested in entertaining the argument, that isn't even confident that argumentation would sort out our disagreement. That's rational pessimism. Right? That there are just fundamentally different ways of looking at things, and there is no ultimate rational consensus about what makes more sense and what doesn't make more sense. So they're trying to defeat the way in which a realist or a rational optimist would say, there's some universal truth here that we can get more of a sense of, or we can be, have, be on better footing in terms of understanding rather than less. Um, Helena says, ha, huh, well, well agreed. Uh, but just curious about that statement. Thanks, I will look into that ethical theory class. Yeah, and I'd be happy to talk to you outside of class about it too. You don't have to wait for them in order to have that conversation with me. Um, but there's some really fascinating, compelling arguments for it. Maybe just as a little sneak preview, um, one of the best arguments that I have uh, that I find compelling on this is, you know, it takes a while to set this up, but the basic force of it is that not respecting the intrinsic value of all people, which is what's sort of behind an idea of, of human rights, um, by necessity is logically contradictory. That you end up, uh, if you try to will an action that's in accordance with, with that kind of way of proceeding. Hi, Daddy. Hey, Luke. Have a fun lunch. We'll see you soon. Um, if you tried to do something like that, then you'd actually be in conflict with your own will. You would be uh, contradicting your own judgments of what is good. So uh, that's that's the, the setup there. <laughs> hey, Luke, my students say hi. They say hi to you. <laughs> um, he doesn't know what to do with that, but I think... He's smiling. Okay, I won't get distracted here. Um, all right, so um, getting back to this. So Nagel is taking as his opponent someone who is challenging the confidence we would have in our both our beliefs about how the world is descriptively, like a scientific worldview, and the ethical side of like what our values are that we think are well-founded and well-argued for and well-justified. We're trying to deflate all that confidence by, by presenting this possibility that they're all just the product of bias. That when you have intuitions that are like, yeah, that, that argument makes sense, that you're not really doing this objective, truth-seeking, in neutral and fair of like looking at everything, you're already endorsing certain fundamental assumptions that are the product of just your cultural time and place, um, that are parochial, right? That if you were born in a different time, you'd have a different worldview, and you wouldn't find any of the arguments of modern 21st century Western civilization compelling, this kind of thing. Um, this has happened, uh, these kinds of accusations have been a part of the history of philosophy throughout all of it, um, but especially in sort of a, a modern world or a postmodern world, you get these kinds of anti-realist, uh, rationally pessimistic views all the time. And Nagel's trying to defeat them. I mean, he's trying to give an argument for why um, that is, shouldn't be a way of approaching matters of disagreement, that there is the possibility of objectivity here. Okay, so at this point, I want to kind of check in with everyone, because I'm about to go into why Nagel thinks he's right, and what argument he tries to deploy against his opponents here, but I just want to make sure the setup of the controversy here, the, the topic of what we're discussing is coming through really nice and clean um, and clear. Let me know if there's anything I can clarify here. So I just want to do a little check-in before I, I plug away going a little further. So Helena asks, how do you know if you're uh, biased and and how if you want to remain unbiased? Um, this is a fantastic question and is a little bit anticipating where this is going uh, in the conversation. So I might, I might hold off on that for just a second because you're about to get a, a fairly robust answer. But I don't think this is something that can be answered really quickly. 
Um, it's, it doesn't necessarily get a very simple answer. Um, but this is part of where Nagel's going to be going. Anything else? Got a lot of people in chat. I'm curious how it's going. Going good. Cool. <laughs> Bernadette's ready for the next part. <laughs> Lucas says, I've never been so comfortable while learning about philosophy. Yeah, those chairs in the classroom suck. Hudson <laughs> agrees about the chairs. Yeah. We could do so much better. Okay, doesn't look like there's any big questions here. I'm gonna I'm gonna take it as a positive sign uh, that things are going okay um, with understanding the framework for this. Okay, so here's Nagel's big argument. He wants to say so. That, kind of going back to your your question, Helena. You, you asked two questions. You asked, how do we know if we have bias, basically, and what do we do about it? How do we protect against bias? To answer the first question, um, Nagel's like, yeah, how do we learn that we're biased? If someone wants to say, my perspective is completely the result of just psychological, sociological, political, cultural forces that are manipulating my intuitions here, what I find rationally compelling, what I don't find rationally compelling, um, if all things are sort of equal here, well, if you want to make that accusation, you you have to be able to defend it. Why should we adopt a relativistic worldview that says there is no ultimate better than or worse here, that their rational pessimism is the right way to go, that reason doesn't have the power, even theoretically, of being capable of resolving all the disagreements that we have? How do you argue for that position? If you want to say everything is biased, Everything is biased. There's no way for someone to be able to operate or present a rational case for why one position should be seen as more justified than another position. If you're destroying objectivity across the board here, um, how are you going to motivate why we should believe in that, in that perspective? And Nagel says, you can't, not without actually... Um, undermining that position itself, that anti-realist, that rational pessimist position, is, which is saying rationality is basically bullshit, can't argue in defense of its own position. And not just for the reason that um, you, you can't give reasons if you're saying reasons can't be given kind of thing. Not, not that kind of contradiction. But, but um, Nagel says, whenever arguments are offered, for why a particular thing is biased. There's always going to be the assumptions in that argument as premises to that conclusion, the accusation of bias. The premises are always going to contain claims that are being said straight, he says, that are being asserted as objective claims that then are, are and also, in addition, are of the same type as the one being rejected. So if you wanted to say something like, Science is just a culturally idiosyncratic way of relating to reality. It's no better and worse than superstitious paradigms or something like that. Um, you want to say it's just the modern bias toward this scientific paradigm, and there's really no fundamental basis for why it is rationally superior or more justified or more objective than any of this other stuff. And how might you try to defend that? Well, you might defend it by trying to reveal the forces of bias that have been present in think the actual people who are doing scientific inquiry. Um, so, and and the fact is, we've got that. <laughs> are scientists biased? Yeah, yeah. Bias definitely attaches to uh, scientific inquiry. 
Um, we've had in the last couple decades tons of sociological studies about what goes on in uh, scientific communities and how those um, communities and those intellectual activities that are being done collectively have plenty of bias in them. But how did we detect that? Well, we did a bunch of sociology. What is sociology? It's a science. It's an empirical observation to try to figure out what's going on. Um, and, and we can do that. Um, some people say it's a soft science, but it is a science. I mean, it's making observations and then theorizing on the basis of those observations to understand what's going on. So this is a good demonstration of Nagel's argument against anti-realism. You can't say it's all bullshit because the, the grounds on which you'd be detecting that there is a concern about bias requires rational argumentation and evidence and justification in order to support. Bye. See you in a little bit. I'm almost done with class. Um, sorry, everyone. Uh, not very professional. Um, so, uh, yeah, because I lost my train of thought. Um, so can we um, make accusations of bias? Could we be concer concerned about bias with respect to what scientists are up to? You bet. And how are we going to do that? More science. <laughs> if someone just wanted to say, I don't know, it just seems that way to me. That's just as good as anything else. I mean, seems like if you want to make that accusation, it does need to be backed up with something. It can't just be like, well, maybe it could happen, or I'm imagining it, or something. Maybe you're just paranoid. You know, there there has to be some teeth given mm -hmm. to that accusation, and then once that happens, this anti-realist or relativist position ends up defeating itself. So think back to relativism. We talked about relativism before. Um, again, we're for the purposes of this discussion. We're granting, for the sake of argument, relativism has a logically consistent thesis and doesn't contradict itself conceptually. Why be a relativist? Maybe because you're concerned about bias. That bias is this u ubiquitous universal phenomenon, and there really isn't some fundamental objectivity to rationality or that some positions, they can't say that, they, that other positions are wrong, they just have their own view and the other people have their own view kind of thing, right? Um, but as soon as the relativist tries to demonstrate that there is that kind of bias, they have to make objective truth claims that they are thinking are not themselves guilty of bias and thus defeated in terms of their authority. You see where this is going? Um, Bernadette is asking, is it kind of like the principle of uniformity of nature defending the principle? The principle of uniformity of nature. No, because that was circular. This is a case where the defense that's being offered for the conclusion contradicts what the conclusion is saying. Okay, so instead of it being circular, it is actually contradictory. Um, okay, cool. All right, that did it for you. Um, Nate Brown asks, uh, is it possible to not be biased? Um, let me get to that <laughs> on the, the what what to do about the response to bias. Right now, we're just kind of entertaining this idea, this uh, rationally fatalistic or pessimistic view that there is no objectivity to have access to ever, that there is no better and worse, that you can say you're right under relativism, but you can't say other people are wrong. There's no independent, neutral playing field um, or set of criteria, like a set of rational criteria, that can be used to weigh these perspectives against each other and figure out which one is the most rationally defensible the way that the rational optimist wants to do. That would be a resolution of a rational controversy if we were able to sort out which position does have the most uh, rational defense or justification, at least for now, with all the things that we have on the table. Uh, we can always learn new things in the future, right? And the, but that's just more of the pursuit of objectivity. The objectivity project is still possible. That's what the rational pessimist denies. There's no hope to this discussion because it's all just going to be people projecting their biases onto each other, and that's that's it. It's merely that. There's nothing more happening. It's the realist or rational optimist who would say there is bias, and there's something that's not bias, <laughs> that both things are happening, and that objectivity is the name of the game. Um, Nagel is saying... Uh, he, uh, one of the other comments uh, you hear Williams reporting on from his book, from Nagel's book, The Last Word, is Nagel saying, we have to just go on in the same way. 
So if you want to talk about bias on scientific grounds, cool. We just we're doing more science. I'm all down for that. Don't have to don't have to get in the way of that. You don't have to reject sociology just because it's talking about bias. You can treat that as a legitimate objective science. Sure, it can make mistakes. It's fallible just like any other science. But um, that's another piece of the puzzle of this ongoing project of trying to figure out reality and, and, and objectivity. That's cool. You just can't be this pessimist who says it's all biased. Because if as soon as you try to defend that view or make a case for it, you're going to be making claims that you're treating as being immune from that, as like apart from that, removed from that. Um, that you're sort of trying to step outside of the game of objective truth claims and Nagel saying you you can never do that you always are going to get roped back into playing the game of objective truth claims I think that way of explaining things is actually a really one of the best tools in my disposal for for um, giving this lecture is thinking about the activity of making objective truth claims maybe you've met someone maybe you sympathize with this yourself um, someone who then this would be kind of an expression of rational pessimism someone who's uh, like I, I don't make objective truth claims that's just people projecting their personal biases onto others I don't do that I'm not gonna play that game yeah I see these other people trying to shove their beliefs down other people's throats dogmatically I'm not gonna do that I'm not gonna play this game I'm not gonna purport to making commitments about what I think is objectively true I can opt out of this or so it might seem Nagel saying you can't do that and as soon as you try to give some justification for even the attempt to do so you're doing it again right you're there's no way to avoid making objective truth claims you're going to do it and the only question is how responsible do you want to be about it do you want to hold those judgments accountable for the kind of thing that they're purporting to be a statement about how things actually are um, do you have good reason for that so so Nagel's kind of saying not only is rational optimism the right thing to do that's the right perspective to take on this but it's the only thing you can do and anything else would just be self-deception that you think that you're able to stand removed from all this but you really can't another example that uh, i have in my memory banks for this kind of phenomenon taking place is someone who wants to like criticize everybody else but doesn't think that they stand for anything themselves I kind of mentioned this phenomenon, I think, at some point earlier this quarter. Um, but it's important to recognize, every time you make a criticism of something else, your argument of your objection has to stand on something in order to launch that objection. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get there, Hudson. Um, so you, you always have to commit to some positive claims in order to reject or criticize something else. Okay? You have, so you can't say, oh, well, I don't have any commitments at all. Um, it's you. You're the one who said something, so you're one the one with the burden of proof. So I can challenge your reasoning, but I don't hold any beliefs myself. Nagel is saying that's just a lie. It's just an illusion. That never happens. The person who is advancing any perspective is going to be committing to at least some claims being objective. If you want to say with all the cultural diversity that um, that one of these perspectives, like say the history of philosophy, for example, this happens all the time. It's just a reflection of Western bias toward rationality or something like that. It'd be like, um, well, what are you proposing then as the perspective? Are you, you're, you're saying you're making some objective claims about what is going on with the history of human intellectual tradition, say in the Western tradition, what impact that has. Um, and you're recommending a particular course of action about what we should do about it. Um, someone said here, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. I mean, that's kind of like um, uh, being easily manipulated. And I think that there is some truth to that kind of uh, little catchphrase. Um, but there, there's also something like, um, if you don't uh, stand up for something or don't attempt to justify your positions, then you're still going to be making objective claims anyway, just probably in an uncritical and unreflective way in one that has low amounts of accountability. Um, and part of the whole idea of being concerned about bias is not to avoid accountability, it's to embrace it. That's why I'm saying bias, uh, you know, especially for Nagel or Williams, um, bias is not something to deny as if it doesn't exist at all. It's just that it can't take this global pessimism. It can't take on this shape of absolute fatalism. 
And that's the thing that Williams is going to really try to plug in here in terms of talking about um, the, the okay, Nagel, you're right, but sort of thing. Um, we're out of time for today. My code word, though, is going to be uh, Mr. Spock. There he is. Rest in peace, Leonard Nimoy. You beautiful man. Um, that'll be the code word for today. So that's what you'll put in the quiz. Um, the thing I want to follow up on when we get together tomorrow is going to be this idea of how you proceed in the same way. And and I, I touched on it briefly how... I'm um, sorry, Hudson, Mr. Spock. That's the code. There you go. Mr. Spock. Yeah. Okay. Um, the thing I touched on briefly about how uh, Nagel is saying, if you want to accuse some other position of, of being illegitimate on grounds of bias, you're going to have to defend it with premises that are not only objective truth claims themselves, but are of the same type as the conclusion that's being criticized. So we talked about trying to undermine mind science, and you're going to have to make scientific claims to do that. But we, I also want to talk about this in the context of um, ethical disputes. So when people say ethics and morality, what's right and wrong and what's good and bad, that's all just cultural bias, that there's no objectivity to it. Uh, the same argument that Nagel's offering with respect to science is also going to have its application in that logical domain, the domain of normative judgments. So that's what I want to pick up on when we get back together tomorrow. Maybe people who are here today can help remind me about that tomorrow in case I lose track of it, but that's exactly the place I'd like to pick up the thread. And then we'll talk about William's response, and then probably not get to Wittgenstein tomorrow, because <laughs> we, lo we kind of lost a day on Monday, so I'm, we'll have to push the schedule a little bit. But um, there you go for today. Um, if you want to stick around and ask me some questions, by all means, I'm not going to just bug out right away. Um, but I know if you need to go for other classes or other things, we're at the end of our official class time right now. Um, so any, any, if anyone wants to stick around and ask some questions, by all means. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. I appreciate how many people are here live, and I definitely want to encourage you to, uh, to speak up and, and contribute. Hudson, uh, maybe maybe you missed this at the beginning. I was talking about how you'll input the code word to a quiz that I'm going to create on Canvas that'll be in the attendance category, like how I've been keeping a grade book for attendance manually up to this point in the quarter. Now the attendance entries are going to be little quizzes where you input the code word. Um, and if people are, are catching this later on YouTube, you'll find the link to the video, the recorded video there as well. I figured it out. Okay, cool, Lucas. <laughs> See you tomorrow. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. You're welcome. I'm actually for, oh, I should stop the recording now. Um,